Okay, well, I guess we should we should go ahead and make a start. My introduction will probably take a minute or so anyway. Uh, so welcome everyone to the next Start of Science Under the Hood seminar. Uh, for those that don't know me yet, my name is Chris Rivandi, and I'm one of the program directors in the centre. And it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, who is Tiru. So Tiru completed his PhD in data science at QUT in 2020. And he's currently working as a postdoctoral fellow within the center uh, in the applied data science theme. His research involves the development of factorization and deep learning methods for data science applications, such as patent mining, uh, clustering and recommended systems. Uh, so today, Thierry is gonna be talking to us about using factorization methods for data fusion and knowledge discovery. So Tiro will talk for around 40 to 45 minutes or so. And then at the end, there will be uh, time for, for him to address um, any questions that have come up. Uh, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please don't hesitate to uh, type them into the Q&A or the chat as we go along. Um, but that's it from me. So now I'm just going to pass it over to Tiro. So if you could just share your screen there, Tiro, and make a start. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, and hello, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, data fusion and knowledge discovery using factorization methods. So the agenda of the day, uh, start with introduction, introducing you to uh, what is data fusion and um, why we go for data fusion and what is the complexities arises and uh, what is factorization technique and what type of factorization techniques exist in the literature and um, how it is used along with data fusion uh, to extract some knowledge out of it. So especially in this talk, I will be focusing on pattern mining, text mining, uh, in-text mining, specifically clustering, and then we will, I will uh, introduce to the knowledge discovery as recommender systems. So at the end, I will also be showing some uh, case studies that we have worked on uh, during my PhD and during my postdoc uh, at, at the Center for Data Science and uh, how we use different factorization techniques and uh, how we fuse different data coming from different aspects and um, what kind of uh, knowledge that we can discover out of it and what kind of benefits it can bring to different applications. So let, let me start with the introduction. So, my talk will be focused on um, uh, more on to more into web personalization and things because I have been working heavily on these applications. But I have to say the application of data fusion and factorizations are not restricted into just web applications or anything related to uh, um, just personalization in terms of uh, uh, data generated from web, for example, social media, etc. It can also be applicable to any domain where you have to extract patterns, where you have to do some clustering, where you have to predict something uh, from a uh, data that can be represented as uh, matrix, tensor, etc. So in terms of web, uh, we start the web with uh, evolution 1, 1 1.0, where it is just static websites. So it means we only use websites to show some information to others. And then we moved on to dynamism. So where in dynamic, uh, we, we would have an, um, uh, the contents are updated depending on the situation. For example, content management system. So you, depending on how you use your content management system, for each user, you will have a different page visualized. And then we had this uh, two-way communication uh, during uh, this dynamism where uh, people started to interact with the websites and um, that has made uh, to generate a lot of data. So now the backend in websites, we, people are interacting, uh, millions and billions of people or users are interacting and using many services. And for each interaction, data has been recorded. And what happens uh, when we generate and when we can able to record data is we can make the system intelligent. So the web, the web systems become intelligent uh, by using many machine learning algorithms um, on uh, the data set that has been collected from user interactions. We are now moving into web 4.0, which is cognitive, where we are going to have multiple applications and bringing some ubiquitous uh, computing where we will uh, have multiple sensors integrated and the data coming from each sensor. And we are going to uh, see how it uh, takes the web into the next level. 
So what type of nature, or what, what nature of data is collected, is generated here? So we users generate interactions. Um, these interactions are recorded, which could be an annotating contents, social relationship, etc. For example, uh, as shown in this figure, we have user as a, as a client, we are going to visualize or we are going to interact with the website. Uh, it could be um, any item, for example, if it is a, a Netflix, you are going to watch a movie. It could also rec record at what time you are watching this movie. So this is something at the same time, we also have this network information. So who is friend with who, for example, in a, a Twitter, in a Facebook, you, you can be able to record that social relationship, like uh, who is your network and what kind of influence you are creating around your network, et cetera. So this means uh, you are generating multi-context data. So the question rises with this uh, nature of data is how we are going to represent this multi-context data. So we have an answer in terms of matrix and tensor. Uh, the one you see on your left is matrix model. For example, if you are going to interact with uh, an item, for example, movie, in this case, uh, the what interaction you are recording is at the end of watching movie, you are going to give some rating. For example, user one rated movie one as with rating three. So you can able to represent that information in a matrix like I have shown in this uh, on your left side, but we are not restricted. The data that we are getting now is not restricted. We can't restrict them into two dimensional representation like matrix. So hence we, are, we need to have some more uh, dimensions included into your matrix model. That's where we move on to tensor model representation. So in tensor model representation, uh, it's like a, a cube when you have three dimensional data, for example, user, item and time or user item and tag in terms of social media. Uh, for example, in movie, you, you can able to see, uh, you can able to record which user uh, rated which movie at what time. So we are capturing, we are trying to capture multidimensional information and that information can be represented in the tensor model. So similarly, when you when you have many more contexts coming or adding up, for example, uh, if you want to add tag or time in addition to uh, user and item, then we go for four dimensional representation. So even that is your uh, higher order representation that can be captured in a tensor model. So any data can be captured and represented in matrix and tensor model. And then now the question is how to analyze or extract meaningful information from this representation, which is our knowledge discovery. What type of knowledge we are going to discover from this data that is represented in matrix and tensor models. So that's where we are good getting into factorization techniques. Um, within factorization, um, we have matrix and tensor factorization because our data can be represented as matrix and tensor as well. Uh, let me introduce uh, some basics of factorization. A simple example to understand uh, what this factorization is, let's take these two, uh, this, uh, this particular equation given here, 45 is equal to five cross uh, five into nine. So what we are uh, showing here is we have one big number 45 that can be represented into two small numbers. The intuition behind this representation is instead of consider it as a matrix, we have a bigger matrix. Uh, uh, when you include that bigger matrix in any process, then the complexity increases, the algorithms or any machine learning approaches that you apply on top of the data set become uh, uh, highly complex. So hence uh, the process or um, uh, hence what we do is we will try to split or we try to decompose or factorize that bigger matrix like here into two smaller matrix when you multiply that two smaller matrix, you are kind of representing on bigger matrix. So that is the intuition behind matrix factorization or any factorization. So when you have more than two dimensions, that is tensor factorization. So let's take an example here. So given a matrix X with the M cross N, where M is your number of rows and N is your number of columns. It could be like items and uh, users. So what happens is we will split or we will decompose that bigger matrix X into two smaller matrices. And we call that smaller matrices as factor matrices or factor, factor matrix or feature matrices. So as shown here, now X is split or factorized into two matrix A and B. When you multiply A and B, we will have an approximated 
x that is x cap which will be um, similar or approximately similar to your input data so in, a, in in this case if you like to have your data populated with only positive values and if you don't want to have any negative values in your um, factor matrices as well as when you reconstruct and when you generate an approximated matrix if you don't like to have any post, I mean, any negative values then we are going to add constraint to your factorization in your matrix factorization that constraint the matrix factorization is called as non negative matrix factorization similarly we have many constraint factorizations depending on many applications i am not going to go get into the details of what type of uh, constraints we have like for example we have sparsity constraints we also have um, graph constraints to recommend the, to to make sure we are representing the data with geometrical structure preserved etc uh, the extension of matrix factorization to higher order uh, data, high dimensional data is your tensor factorization. So the, the, the basics are fundamental of both matrix and tensor factorizations are the same, but in tensor factorization, we will have three dimensional uh, representation. Hence, it is going to factorize your tensor into multiple rank one tensors. As you can see here, your input tensor X is now split into multiple or D rank one tensors. So each of them are representing a feature. So it means um, here your factor matrix A is the combination or concatenation of A1, A2, and AD as a matrix. Similarly, we have a B matrix, factor matrix, when you concatenate or when you, uh, when you just uh, add them as columns, that is B1, B2, and up, up to BD, then that is another factor matrix. Similarly, we are generating a, three factor matrices representing three different dimensions or three different modes we, we will call it in tensor language and uh, we used to uh, we use some factorization algorithms on top of it to identify the values there are multiple factorization approaches uh, for example you also have tucker factorization in tensor where instead of having multiple rank one tensors we also have in addition to this rank one tensors we have a core tensor that captures the interaction between multiple features from different modes. So definition of rank and number of lower dimensions is a question that um, has to be uh, addressed or it is, it's like an important, important thing to know before we move forward. What is this rank and what happens and what happens and when do we use it? So let us consider we are setting it to two in a case, um, uh, but rank, rank is nothing but a hidden feature. It's, it means, it's going to represent your data in somehow, in some way, but we don't know what is the true meaning of that feature because um, it's, not, uh, it's not generated on some assumptions. It is like it is generating by, by knowing the association between uh, the multiple uh, observations in your data set. For example, in movies, if we set two as rank, it means we could characterize movies based on two features but we don't know what is the true meaning of that feature for example it could be science fiction action drama romance and comedy so these are all features of a movie but uh, since it is hidden features we can't able to label each feature with these names uh, but as a humans we can able to give these uh, labels but for machine it doesn't know so hence we call it as uh, hidden features so optimization um, the one question that we uh, that we have to uh, see here or that may arise with you is how we are going to populate the values for these features because we don't know them uh, how we are going to uh, identify the values we are going to identify these values using non convex optimization which means we randomly initialize the values for example if we set rank as 2 we will have two columns representing each user as like in this uh, in this matrix, and then we randomly initialize them with some value. Similarly, we will randomly initialize some uh, values for our matrix B transpose. So now our objective is to have, when you multiply these two randomly initialized matrix, now the objective is to replicate or to reconstruct the original input matrix. So it's like by randomly initializing, we can able to calculate the error, how, uh, how that matrix is, and by, uh, by using that error, we can update the factor matrices 
uh, we will uh, change the values for this randomly initialized uh, factor matrices and then it continues for multiple iterations and we use non-convex optimization algorithms to do or uh, to find the values for it. So what are all those or what are all the main factorization or non-convex optimization algorithms exist in order to learn the values for your uh, factor matrices? It is broadly classified into four where we have a uh, first one alternating least squares, gradient descent, uh, coordinate descent, and selective coordinate descent. So selective coordinate descent is something that we uh, uh, proposed in my PhD, during my PhD, and uh, which is computationally efficient algorithm. Uh, that will, um, because tensor and matrix, when you combine them and when you do the fusion, it increases a lot of, comp it, it introduces a lot of complexity. Hence, and, um, sophisticated algorithms are necessary to address the problems that comes along with the complexity of the data. To address that, we propose selective coordinate descent optimization algorithms that can able to treat the data well. So in ALS, which is alternating least to square, we try to update the entire factor matrix in each iteration. But in gradient descent, we go row by row of each factor matrix. For example, in factor matrix A, we will first update the first row of your factor matrix. Then we will move on to the second row, third row, and third row, uh, fourth row. Uh, but in coordinate descent, uh, which is one of the efficient algorithm, we will go element-wise. It means we first select one factor matrix, and within that factor matrix, we will select first element and update it, and we will move on element by element. In selective coordinate descent, what happens is uh, we are we are trying to propose why should we update all the elements instead why can't we do some selective strategy why can't we apply some selective strategy to update only the elements that's going to um, help in minimizing the loss function or objective function that we define and uh, we have uh, different uh, variations of selective coordinate descent within that so als um, the goal of the goal of uh, CP factorization or tensor factorization with R components or R rank is to approximate uh, is to learn the factor matrices that best approximates the input. So we use equilibrium distance as the objective function. It means we are going to minimize the distance or we are going to minimize uh, the error based on this equilibrium distance between the factor matrices and your input data. So we will have an objective function defined like this. Uh, and then we will, uh, in alternative least square, as I was saying, first we will fix the values, we randomly initialize and we fix the values for factor matrix B and C, and we try to solve, uh, we try to find the answer for A. Then we fix A and C, and we try to update or to solve for B. Similarly, it goes on to multiple iterations. At the end, we are trying to get to a converged solution. The problem with ALS is uh, it's poor convergence. Since it's going on the entire matrix, it also will have a uh, huge scalability issue. When you have tensors and uh, when you have multiple matrices, multiplications involved within your tensor, then the complexity grows a lot because you are going to deal with millions of users and millions of maybe thousands and hundreds of uh, items and time uh, things. So in order to address that, uh, gradient descent has been uh, proposed in matrix and tensor factorization. So where the objective is to learn the slope and then we update it based on some learning uh, uh, learning rate and uh, that goes row by row, so which brings some efficiency to your model. But the problem is uh, the runtime because it, it, it repeats uh, row wise and then uh, go row by row, it's a bit slow in learning. And uh, again, it will not uh, scale for large data set when you have a huge uh, when you have a huge number of users and then the when the need for higher rank is coming into the picture then your gradient descent becomes converging uh, or problem with the uh, scalability so the coordinate descent is another approach where we update element wise element wise so the objective function defined here like this is split into uh, your multiple sub problems to update each element uh, based on the concept of residues uh, the problem with the uh, coordinate descent is it goes element by element and it has to be repeated multiple times because you are only concentrating on uh, one single element every time. So it means the number of iterations or number of updates that you're performing has to be increased, which, uh, which is unwanted complexity or unwanted, uh, uh, unwanted things that is happening behind. 
So the selective strategy, selective coordinate descent, which is having, um, we have multiple, we have proposed multiple strategies. The one that is the state of the art is greedy coordinate descent, where we go row by row, and each row we only select the most important element. It means the unwanted updates on the elements that are not going to contribute to minimize the objective function is removed from the analysis. I mean, it's not updated in the factorization process. Instead, only the important features that can able to minimize the error or selected and updated. Again, the problem with the greedy coordinate descent is it's a repetitive strategy. Sometimes you have to repeat uh, many, many times and same variables or same elements will be updated multiple times. Hence, we go on to some advanced strategies where we use this objective function and how much it minimizes the objective function and we select in each iteration instead of repeating repeatedly selecting any one element or updating, we now select a set of elements that are found most useful in minimizing the objective function. So now let's move on to data fusion. So we now know what is uh, factorization and how, how factorization works and what we get out of it. So when it comes to data fusion, we have, a, we have to reflect back on what is the nature of data set. Let's take this example here. Uh, here you can see user is associated with item. Item is associated with tag. And you can also see the interlink. All of them are interlinked or all of them are associated with each of them. But the user to user relationship, the friendship is not related to the item. It means the association only exists between user and the user. So it means uh, it's not fitting into a tensor representation. If it is just user item and uh, time, then that fits completely in tensor. When you just represent user and user information, then that fits in matrix model. But what happens if your data set is having this nature when where there is a mix of matrix and tensor? That's where we go on to apply fused or coupled matrix tensor models, um, where depending on the nature of different data sets, we can select the model, or it's like a flexible model that we built using both matrix and tensors. For example, the one you see on the left most is we are uh, we are kind of uh, coupling or fusing two matrices. It means you have user item on one matrix, you have user to user friendship information on the other matrix. Now we were going to share the mode user because user is shared between both the matrix, then we couple it like this. Similarly, when you have two tensors that needs to be coupled, we go for a coupled tensor model. When uh, we have tensor and matrix to be coupled, we go for coupled matrix models. The most commonly used one is matrix and co matrix coupled with tensor because it has a lot of uh, applications. Most, many of the data sets are coming into this nature. So when you have that representation, we are going to have factorization done on top of that representation. It means it's not just matrix factorization, it's not just tensor factorization, but it is coupled matrix, coupled tensor or coupled matrix tensor factorization. So what happens is in, uh, let's take for first one, coupled matrix factorization, the objective function is now added. For example, you have objective function where the objective is to minimize or to find the correct value for A, B, and C factor matrices. Given our first objective is on matrix X, uh, matrix Z, uh, which is here. And the second uh, part, second component of this objective function is concentrating on your matrix Y. So we have, we have now two objective here to minimize Z at the same time to minimize Y, but we have a shared mode A. If you see this equation, so you can find while minimizing for Z, we have A. While you're minimizing for Y, we also have A. But the other factor matrix is changed. It means we are trying to learn the association between two data sets by uh, we are bridging it through this shared mode. So by using these kind of approaches, now we have a modified objective function. And for this objective function, we will uh, adapt the algorithms, factorization algorithms, and we will uh, try to learn better learn these factor matrices. In a similar way, we have this coupled tensor factorization. So where instead of uh, two matrices in our objective function, now we have two tensors coming into the picture. Similarly, when it is coupled to matrix tensor factorization, instead of two matrices and instead of two tensors, now we have a mix of matrix and tensor like this. So the one important thing uh, that we have to note here is the shared mode. 
So where we are sharing the information between these two contextual information, for example, uh, user item tag and user to user friendship. Here user is shared. So we have to preserve this information and we use this information in learning the features of all the, all the modes. So now we are moving on to the knowledge discovery from factorization. So we now see, we have now seen how data is generated and what kind of representation is needed. And we have used factorization for knowledge discovery, but what kind of knowledge is discoverable, discoverable from your factorization? So traditionally, uh, basically we have three different ways of using the output from your uh, uh, matrix or tensor factorization, which includes usage of your factor matrices, which is your output from your factorization, as features, as kernel, as reconstruction. So if you use them as features, we can use it for pattern mining. If you use them as kernel, we can use it for text mining, especially clustering. When you use them to reconstruct, we can use it for recommender systems. Let's move on one by one. Uh, but uh, what complexities uh, brings when you have this uh, coupling is, uh, or your, when you fuse your data is increased sparsity. For example, uh, instead of representing two dimension, if you go for three dimension, we are increasing the dimensions, which means curse of dimensionality comes into the picture uh, that, that will introduce sparsity problems. So it means your algorithms, factorization algorithms should be able to deal with sparse data set. At the same time, increasing the dimensions will increase the complexity. And how are you going to learn them efficiently, computationally efficient algorithms are in demand. And um, some associated problems include um, simultaneous elimination issue. It means the algorithm should not, or uh, the factor matrices should not uh, have a repeated features learned from them. So how we are going to address these complexities is based on uh, the algorithms that you define, factorization algorithms. So let's start with pattern mining. So pattern mining is nothing but the process of identifying some frequently or periodically occurring patterns in the data set. Um, it can be a spatial pattern, it can be a temporal pattern, or it can be a behavioral pattern. For example, it can also be an uh, topics or uh, how when, how a document is represented, how when, uh, what type of textual pattern is exist in your documents. And um, we, we uh, conjecture that the factor matrices learned during factorization are derived based on the associations. If you recall the tensor factorization, we represent them as uh, rank one tensors. It means we are trying to associate each feature with the, uh, each feature of one mode with the same feature of other modes. I mean, at the same, uh, if it is rank one, we will uh, we will have the association preserved between the rank one of mode uh, one, rank one of mode two, and rank one of mode three. So like this, um, so this is the rank one tensor factorization. If you assume uh, we have a tensor with three features or three dimensions, um, time, location, and user. So the user is present in this location at this time. Then we will use this approximation of rank one tensors and we, um, we can able to find the relationship between in pattern one, what is the user user's behavior and what is the location behavior and what is the time behavior. So we can also use this to compare. For example, in this figure, in pattern one, people are very active in hour three and hour seven. If you represent the time as 24 hours, and in pattern R, you have a hover one and hover 24 as dominating values. It means there's a, there is a different pattern exist. And for this different pattern, we have a different users who are belonging to that pattern and we have different locations that belongs to this pattern. For example, if you take a real scenario of traffic, you have a peak time in the morning and also like not everyone travels in the morning. For example, some people tend to have a night shift. They only travel in night. So these type of different the patterns that you can capture by understanding the, or by learning the futures well. In terms of text mining and clustering, um, we, are, we, are, uh, we, we are going to use this NMF and we can use them, use the output to map it to clusters. For example, if you have a text document, we can represent the text document as document and term matrix. Once you do the factorization, we will have two factor matrices W and H, and uh, the dominating value in each row will indicate in the document factor matrices, it will indicate what is the cluster or what is the feature that is highly representing this document. And we can directly use that for clustering purpose, or you can also use it as an uh, input 
it's like a dimensionality reduction. We are reducing the dimensions of documents into terms, into documents, into rank. So we have now futures reduced. Now we can able to build some clustering on top of this reduced futures. So this will increase the generalization rather than also it reduces the, um, the problem of a, a curse of dimensionality in uh, text data. So recommender systems, um, recommender systems, traditionally NMF and NTF has been uh, uh, heavily used nowadays in uh, recommender systems. What is recommender system is if you are trying to uh, predict something and if you're going to predict what this user likes and we are going to recommend some item for this user, for example, whenever you go to Amazon or Netflix, you will you will always see something coming up like uh, people who bought this also bought this and also like uh, based on your behavior based on what you bought in the previous previous time like last three months or six months it will try to recommend it it will show you recommended items for you that recommended items are generated based on your user based on your behavior and uh, what type of items you purchased and it the recommender systems will find the similarity between the users and it will uh, recommend a new item for you that has been bought by the different user who shares the same uh, kind of items that you purchased previously. So how we get it is based on reconstruction. I will uh, quickly go through an example of how a reconstruction works here and how it is helpful in uh, predicting or recommending. So let's take you have user features, like and dislike, and you have movie features, romantic and action movie. So this is user and movie matrix. So you can able to see the question mark. Uh, the question mark indicates you have some missing values present. It means user one hasn't watched movie four. So now the intuition is, can you predict or can you say this user one likes movie four? So that's your recommendation. So now we can, how can we find it is by learning this user features. Let's take an example. You have this matrix now, and uh, using factorization, you are learning the future for user one, like zero and one. So, which indicates user one likes um, um, likes and user one dislikes. So, user one likes what movie? In Spider Man, it's an action movie. The second feature is action. So, user one likes action movie. User one does not like romantic movie. So when you do the dot product, when you multiply these two, we will have a values populator for this movie. Because you don't need to have these features specifically for this particular user for this movie. Rather, these interaction or the interaction between each users will help us to learn the values here. Now it's like kind of we are reversing reverse engineering. Now we use the learned features to find the association between a uh, user and a movie by doing reconstruction. So now this question mark is replaced with five. So it means your model is predicting based on the similarity of this user watching or rating other movies with these characteristics or these features. What is the prediction? What your model says is this particular user may rate Spider-Man with or any movie with a rating of five. And we can use this rating or this reconstructed missing uh, reconstruction where you have missing values predicted to predict or to generate recommendations. Similarly, we can able to find the missing values of all other users when you have these feature values of factor matrices populated by learning from uh, factorization algorithms. So now, um, so we have seen uh, different coupling, like how we couple or how we fuse different uh, data represented in matrix and tensor and now we, um, we also seen how factor factorization algorithms is used to learn some or used to uh, discover some knowledge out of your matrix and tensor data. So here I'm going to present some of the case studies where we have used um, uh, such approaches in real world data sets. The first one is the fusion of neighborhood information with tensor. So what you see here is on your left is um, your location and uh, the proximity information. So for each location, how distance is the other location? So in, in, in our case, we use the Singapore elderly citizens data set. Um, so where we have this um, data set of elderly people where they have mobile phones that recording their location. It's a voluntary uh, uh, survey conducted by Singapore University of Technology and Design. And I was part of that project where we collected the data of uh, elderly people uh, from their mobile phone that includes at what time 
at what time and what location and how long that person stayed, that uh, elderly person stayed. The motivation of this is to improve the environment, living environment for elderly people in Singapore. So the first thing is to understand their behavior, to understand the behavior uh, we wanted to use, we wanted to know their patterns, how they move in weekend, how they move on the daytime, whether they are very active in the daytime or whether they are very active in the nighttime. So understanding the behaviors will help the government to perform many, uh, can help the government to take necessary actions. Um, so the traditional way of using it is to do some matrix or tensor factorization, but what we also have is user, user to user proximity information. So if you are in a, it is based on an intuition, like if you are in a same suburb, you might be behaving same, in a similar way and you will be having an, a different association with different locations. So how can we include this information in tensor is we moved on with a matrix coupled with tensor information. So, so we do the factorization on this and we have uh, also added some sparsity constraints to, to avoid few complexities coming because the data set is very sparse as well as we don't want to see any repeated patterns uh, like this one you see on right, uh, rightmost in the bottom, you can see some repeated patterns here. So there is no point of learning that repeated pattern. So we uh, we add many constraints. We will uh, we will uh, try to uh, we will try to learn the factor matrices without having these repeated patterns. So this is something that we get out of uh, the data set as factor matrices. So it means in the objective function we have A B C D. If uh, A indicates uh, user and B indicates the time and C indicates the location factor matrices, we are going to use B and C to get this output directly, which is like a pattern mining and how we use uh, futures for patterns. We can able to see the relationship between uh, uh, locations and time, at what location and what type of pattern arises in which locations. So this gives some uh, more information on how to interpret the behavior of elderly people. Uh, in, a, in another case study, we have uh, we have used it for detecting missing information and their and their spatial temporal topic dynamics in Twitter uh, that is related to COVID nineteen uh, tweets. During COVID nineteen, people has posted a lot of things related to COVID nineteen, and it means uh, they also they also spread some misinformation. So it is inevitable people uh, try to share it without without knowing the fact but uh, that has a different uh, impacts on how people react to that misinformation is very crucial to understand and it is important to stop the, such, such kind of misinformation. So like how we are going to, but the problem with uh, COVID-19 or anything is we don't know which is, uh, what is misinformation. It's like we don't know the labels. So then the problem is if we don't have any labels or if we have only a less labeled data, how can we understand how that misinformation is spreading or how that dynamic dynamics is like, how their spatial temporal dynamics is. So in order to do that, we have, a, there are multiple ways of identifying them, which is one class classification and similarity based approaches and information retrieval based approaches. So we in this, we in this work has collected tweets in Australia. It's like 60 million tweets during COVID-19. And we have a small label, the misinformation data collected from uh, some of the, uh, NGOs like pointers where they will fact check. So by doing the fact checking, we are trying to capture the topics, which is pattern in terms of text. Now we use that as a search query and we collect from the collected uh, tweets, we try to rank, uh, we try to find the misinformation tweets based on the topics, not based on the terms or not based on any other uh, similarity measure by mapping each uh, misinformation to your query or uh, each misinformation from your label data to each tweets. Instead, we go on to generalize it. We first get the topic and based on the topic, we try to collect or we try to uh, filter out only the missing in, uh, misinformation tweets. On top of that misinformation, uh, by once we identified the misinformation tweets that can be represented as term, time, and location. So each tweet is associated with a location. Each tweet is again associated with a time. So it means we can able to easily construct a tensor out of the text data, and we do that. And for each text information, we also have this 
topic information because we know in previous step from an on, from a label data we have we can able to identify the topic of uh, tweets so we are we are now trying to give additional information to your model so that it can able to identify the topics revolving around misinformation in related to covid-19 in twitter and similar fashion we have um, we have extracted some uh, temporal spatial patterns uh, based on the topics or misinformation topics. So these are all some results that we get out of it. For example, um, um, especially the, the third one that you see here is uh, glycol, ethylene gly glycol and um, how it reacts with the humans. Like there, was, there has been some misinformation on people drinking uh, ethylene glycol and saying like it cures COVID-19. So it's very dangerous practice and it is it's, it, is, it must be stopped immediately. This kind of misinformation must be stopped very, very soon. So, but before that, we have to know how it is spreading so that we can able to take necessary actions. You can see it has been spreading to major cities in Australia, like just one day and then it stopped. But when you have, when you see any patterns like repeating patterns, and if, if you see the concerns, then that must be acted um, accordingly. So another case study is on uh, multi-view text clustering. So what we've seen before, both of them are patterns, like how can we use your matrix tensor factorization for pattern mining? Now, the another application is how can we use it for clustering text data, uh, especially multi-view text data. Uh, multi-view text data is something where you can able to represent same information in multiple views. Uh, document represented with English, document written in French, and document written in German. It means same information, but represented in three different languages. Uh, it has been shown um, by using all this information, the clustering can be improved. Um, uh, so the intuition now is how can we fit this representation in coupled matrix in factorization? And we have seen uh, by doing coupled matrix factorization where we couple uh, all these three factor matrices has improved the performance of clustering the text documents, not just based on one language, but based on three different languages. Similarly, you have uh, some other information like content, keyword, and actor. It's like same movie or same document with a different uh, additional information, multi-context or multi-view information. How can we put that in, in a coupled uh, architecture, coupled framework, and how can we make them uh, learn the clustering or learn the association uh, between each documents using all the multi-view information. So the other case study is on uh, recommender systems. We have seen clustering with text and we have seen topic modeling and we have seen pattern mining, but with recommender systems, uh, uh, the intuition is like, it's coming back to the first topic when you couple your matrix. We have user to item matrix like movie, user has movie information. At the same time, we also have user to user trust information. So where uh, the information like this particular user is a friend with this particular user. So this network is like a trust. We are using that trust to make sure we recommend better items. Because if, if your friend is recommending you some restaurants, you will obviously go and try it rather than someone recommending. Similarly, uh, when you have this trust information, you will take uh, you might be influenced by this trust information. So we wanted to see how this trust is helping to recommend uh, movies or to recommend uh, restaurants based on their previous visits. So the, the, the intuition here is like, we have two information. One is coming from matrix, another is also coming from matrix. We could do coupled matrix factorization, we have done that. Then we have extended the work by, by asking a question, why can't we, why should we use all the information from source domain that is user to use the trust information? Rather, we only use a few information or needed information that can help to uh, better predict or better recommend in your target domain, which is your user to item rating data. So we have proposed an architecture that is based on future selection, where we first do the uh, NMF and we capture the features or um, where we capture an information knowledge from your source domain. And we try to use that knowledge as an initialization for your target domain. And we come up with a measure to calculate the future importance on which feature from your source domain is helping to minimize the objective function in your target domain. And we have come up with a new future selection strategy and we select the features. So this has given a better recommendations generated and the performance has been drastically improved. So to conclude, so what we have seen is different matrix tensor data representation, 
and how can we do the couple couple factorization but while we doing couple factorization what we have to keep in mind is the computational co complexities uh, how can we make an uh, couple factorization computationally efficient and uh, how can we make the factorization because it is based on non convex optimization uh, reaching to a better solution uh, local or global minima is very important um, though the non convex optimization will always uh, go into your local minima how can you make you reach the best local minima and how can we theoretically prove that and uh, what is the how how can we able to generate the features that has been used in different ways in a better um, so that your feature should be learned in a better way so by adding constraints or by changing your factorization algorithms etc so once you do this factorization how and what type of knowledge you get discovered out of it is pattern mining text mining and recommender systems which is suitable for multi context data representation um as i was as i was saying in the beginning it is not restricted to only these applications i am so showing it has an n number of applications where you can able to fit the data in a matrix representation if you can able to fit the data and if your objective at the end is to discover some meaningful knowledge like pattern mining text standard recommender systems like filling misinformation if that is an objective it is not needed to be a recommendations predicting something when you have missing data in your original matrix format so these kind of different applications comes with different domains especially tensors has been used in chemometrics uh, brain signal processing image reconstruction uh, so there is a n of n number of applications exist but the talk i am giving you here is only focused on what i have been working on in the past uh, in the past few years during my phd and during my uh, post doc um that's pretty much it from me if you have any questions i'm happy to answer now Thanks, thanks, Thierry, for a really nice um, presentation. It's really cool to see um, all the different applications of um, matrix and tensor factorization. Um, so I'm just having a look into the... So we do have one question in the Q&A now. Um, there's actually a couple of questions in there. So the first one is, um, do sparse features have more interpret interpretability? Yes. Um... Uh, thanks it's from Shrubama. It's, it's a good question. Uh, yes, sparse features have more interpretability. Uh, it depends on uh, the out outcome, how you want to use it again. If your objective is to, uh, to predict the, or to have the pattern mining feature is very important to be interpreted with sparsity. But if your objective is not to interpret as a patterns, but to interpret or to use the features for uh, recommendation generations then having sparsity may affect because at the end if you add sparse sparsity to your features by reconstruction we will not have any um, we might not have the missing values populated from your original data once approximation is done so hence it depends on application so if you have a if your objective is to learn features or to learn patterns out of your data set uh, definitely sparsity constraints and learning uh, sparse features will uh, improve your the interpret interpretation. Excellent. So that's the second part of the question there as well. Um, so this one is related to the Tucker decomposition mm -hmm. and how it gives an associate an association amongst the features extracted in different modes. So the question is, what is the practical interpretation of association, and is it similar to correlation? Yes, it is similar to correlation. So it means like uh, we, are, we, are we are trying to give some importance to each features learned from different modes. So if we don't have that uh, core tensor in Tucker decomposition, we can't able to uh, give uh, or we can't able to weight each feature differently. If there is an objective where if you want to focus or if you want to uh, rank the features based on their importance or something like that, then having this core tensor will help in terms of uh, uh, in terms of saying, when you use certain feature, how how much weightage you should give to that feature. So it's kind of a, will give you the, not the correlation, but the importance of uh, how each interaction between um, different features should be treated in the outcome. Thanks, Tira, that makes sense. Um, so I, um, I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, so one of them is how difficult is this optimization problem in the sense that, you know, when you when you start the optimization from different random starts, does it converge to something different? 
Um, and if it does, does that matter in terms of how sensitive the uh, conclusions of the results are? Yes. Yes, Chris, like uh, it's it's a very uh, difficult problem in NMF and NTF, especially um, with optimization. Yes, of course, the way we initialize will uh, will have a different, will obviously contribute to what happens at the end of optimization. So people try to, uh, sometimes people try to use SVD, single singular value decomposition to initialize the factor matrices. And uh, we start to further learn it from that initialization. So um, again, when you are initializing it with some different scales, the gradient vanishing problems comes in. So it's similar to any optimization. So it must be treated in a similar way. And um, since we are trying to add, uh, or we're trying to modify the values based on the associations between, uh, for example, A, while learning A, we fix B and C. While learning B, we fix A and uh, uh, C. So it means every time it will try to come up with the new values, so hence the objective function or when during optimization, uh, it's quite difficult to come to a uh, global solution or even the best local solution. Hence the uniqueness comes into the picture. How can you make uh, your uh, optimization come to a unique solution? There has been a lot of research going on in terms of how can we make it, uh, make at the end, we can have a unique solution. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, the, yeah, one yeah. of our research is on uh, like selecting this feature. One of the reason why we select the elements during optimization is to avoid such uh, problems rather than updating all the elements and each time when you update it will it might change the gradients it means it might go to a different solution so we don't want to we don't want that to happen instead uh, selecting features based on their importance will uh, minimize the deviation in, in calculating the gradients hence it might go into a uh, better local minima rather than a most local minima mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Terry. Um, so maybe just one last question I had was around um, how do you choose the R, so the lower dimensional thing in the matrix factorization? Like, do you just yeah. try different values and see what results you get or? Yeah, yeah, Chris, like, uh, again, it depends on the usage. For example, in pattern mining, uh, we will try to have some domain expertise come into the picture. For example, how many patterns you like to get out of your data? If you are interested in like, it's like clustering. If you just, I wanted to see five or six patterns, then we will fix the number of rank. But in recommender systems or in general, we will do sensitivity analysis. Uh, we will start from um, lower rank and we will run different models at the, until like increasing to 200, 300 ranks. And we will find the convergence point because after few, uh, when you add more rank after few, for example, 20, your model will not improve the accuracy a lot. So it means the data set inherently having only 20 important features. So we can able to fix the rank based on the approximation error by uh, calculating the approximation error or running your model or running your tensor factorization with uh, different ranks and finding the optimal rank based on the approximation error. Mm, okay, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, okay, so I don't think I don't really think we have any um, further questions for today, which is I guess is good because we're almost running out of time anyway. So thanks very much again, Thierry, for for a really great um, presentation there. Thank Looking you, under the hood of um, <laughs> matrix and um, tensor factorization, yeah. it's really nice. Yeah. Thanks for and thanks for giving me the opportunity to present my results. And, no and problem, research. and thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, and thanks very much everyone else for coming along today and um yeah i guess that's it for today so thanks very much everyone again and hope to see you next time bye for now